Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, I already have to laugh a little here because the last thing I ever thought we're going to react to on this channel is dinosaurs. Today we're going to watch the video, This is what Islam says about dinosaurs by One Islam Productions. Coming from a Christian perspective, I do not believe in dinosaurs. Yes, I am aware we have huge bones laying around everywhere, but then in the end it comes down to interpretation how archaeologists put those bones together. I personally do not believe that those are dinosaurs like Hollywood shows them to be. With no further ado, let's have a look. <laughs> So the question always comes, especially for people that believe in creation and things of that sort. What about the dinosaurs that were here before human beings? Do we even believe in dinosaurs? What about the disgusting little creatures and critters? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create them? And what, or what do we have to say about them? First of all, the most beneficial aspect when you're speaking about the creation of the animals is that which relates to us. And what that means is, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said, Allah created us as human beings between the angels and the animals. And so you have angels that have absolutely no desire, no will. Their sole purpose is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their sole yes. uh, existence is just to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they're free from those desires. And then you have it's on the so absolutely fascinating to me personally because this is not what I heard in Christianity. However, this is what I experienced in the Amazon rainforest when I met the shamans and I had my spiritual experiences there. Again, disclaimer here, this is just for educational entertainment purposes. I do not recommend this to anyone. If anything, I urge you to stay away from it because there is more negative that can come to you than positive. It is extremely dangerous. However, yes, I went there and I want to share my experience with you. And again, guys, don't take my word for it. If you think this is just a hallucination, that is your God-given right. I personally do believe that those encounters were real, but that is my perspective. And yes, I saw angels. What was surprising to me is that they didn't look like the Catholic descriptions of angels, regular human figures with wings. Quite the opposite. Those beings were made out of pure light and they were gigantic. They were so big. It was unbelievable. But they were made out of a pure light that was coming directly from God. They had their characters, they had their attributes, but at the same time they were so closely connected to God that they couldn't do their own will. They could only do the will of God. This is truly what I saw and it absolutely correlates to the Islamic description. The other side, the animals on the on the far end of the other spectrum, the animals who don't have those uh, you know, you know, who don't have reasoning and don't worship exactly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exactly. the way that the angels do. And they're just full of desires, unrestricted desires. Yes. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah No impulse control whatsoever and we're exactly in the middle. Said, we find ourselves in between. And what that means is wow. if we incline towards our desires more, our unrestricted desires more, then we become like animals. And Absolutely. if we incline towards worship and reason, then we become like the angels. Yes. And in fact, as human beings, we have the potential. It is very correct. And when we drink alcohol, then we become like animals. We bring our consciousness down to the animalistic level. Potential to be. There are only two ways. I really have to say this here. There are only two ways for humans to go into the direction of the godly, the divine, or into the direction of the animal. As we'll talk about, as we'll talk, we become like the angels. And in fact, as human beings, we have the potential to be better than the angels, as we'll talk about uh, when we choose to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when we choose to use our reason and our intellect in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have the potential to be worse than animals yes. because the animals are not held accountable because of the, the, the uh, missing reasoning and things of that sort. And so it's important for us to find ourselves in that spectrum. Where do we fall? Do we fall towards the soul that is at peace, the nafs that is at peace, the nafs al-mutma'inna, or a nafs al-bahima, the animal-like self, which is just territorial, 
uh, desires intimacy and food and drink and so on and so forth. Now, when we talk about the uh, you know the chronological order of creation, Islam actually does clearly say that animals were created before human beings. Uh, this is established in authentic okay. hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said that Adam alayhi salam was the last of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. And we'll talk about that inshallah ta'ala uh, going forward. And in that is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided everything, has placed everything at our service. That when we come into existence as human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already created uh, the scene. It's already there. Uh, Allah Azza wa also says in the Quran in Surah Luqman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He created the skies, the heavens without pillars that you see. And He's cast into this earth firmly set mountains so that it keeps it stable. And He spread throughout this earth all types of creatures. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually makes that clear in the Quran as well. Dabba means beasts, means any type of creature that you can imagine. And so we know that before we got to this earth, there were, you know, all kinds of dinosaurs, beasts, and that's one of the crimes maybe, of the jinn, is that they didn't treat them well, as we spoke about previously. And you had roaches as well, and, and some of those disgusting little critters that existed. Actually, even before the dinosaurs, uh, you know, scientifically, they think that roaches existed millions. Yeah, they're not disgusting. They're just alien to us. And this is why they appear disgusting. But nevertheless, they are a creation of God. And therefore, we have to respect them one way or the other. ...of years before the dinosaurs. And so you ask yourself, why? All right, so if we establish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them there before us, and that there is benefit to them, why, you know, why do we have roaches? Why do we have rats? Why do we have all these disgusting little creatures. And, and you know, uh, SubhanAllah, when it comes to roaches, I grew up with roaches. I had roaches all over the place growing up. I remember there were times that I wouldn't actually go to the kitchen because I knew that there were going to be roaches there after 10 o'clock. <laughs> that was their time and they took over. So, especially with roaches, yeah, I guess this was a night. theological crisis for me. You know, why are there roaches in the world? Now, the simple answer to that is that Allah made all of these animals as a form of risk for you, as a form of sustenance for you. And he made them a form of sustenance for each other. And he made the insects sustenance for them. Okay, so you find that when a bird is alive, and subhanAllah, things change, circumstances change. When a bird is alive, it feasts on ants, it eats ants. When the bird dies, the ants eat the bird. Right, so these, these animals right. and these creatures are, 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 are sustenance for one another. They're risk for one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it in perfect balance. And there are things that are even beyond our understanding. So when it comes to the roaches, you know, their most powerful role in the ecosystem, of course, is decomposing. And we don't really see that, but they pick up dirt. There would be a lot more dirt in the world without them. They eat rotten foods and they eat decaying material. And through their waste, it's put back into the soil and it's made beneficial and, and, and bacteria is cleared and so on and so forth. Meaning, subhanAllah, that even those things that to us are simple, you know, are nuisances, there is a purpose. They play a greater role in this balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Al-Mizan, you know, the, the way that He's made everything just and balanced in His creation. There is a role for everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything has its place, of course. If you remove something, everything would fall apart. There is knowledge behind it that we simply cannot understand. People are complaining about mosquitoes, but everything has its place. It needs to be there. And I would even go so far to say that this is part of submitting to God. Because if you start questioning why are there cockroaches, why are there mosquitoes, you are questioning the creation. And with that, you are questioning the creator. You can create a single insect, a single animal without purpose. And subhanAllah, we find that the animals uh, actually see things that we are incapable of seeing. Sure. And we spoke about this when we talked about the limitations of human beings and things of that sort. But you'll find, you know, the color spectrum even, that there are some animals that subhanAllah, it's not even the distance of sight. When they look at something, our color spectrum is far more limited than them, meaning they're able to see light and they're able to see different colors uh, that we wouldn't even know existed, even though they'd be looking at the same surface. And the reason why I bring that up is that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that they are able to see things of al ghaib of the unseen, mm -hmm. that as human beings we're not able to see. Yeah, we just reacted to a parrot freaking out on a graveyard. And on top of that, me personally being around dogs, I do believe that they see something that we don't. And the Prophet ﷺ gives us something beneficial in that regard. He says ﷺ, that when you hear the crowing of the rooster, فَاسْأَلُ اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ فَإِنَّهَا رَأَتْ مَلَكَةً 
When you see the crowing of a rooster, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings because that rooster has seen an angel. And the Prophet said, when you hear the braying of a donkey, then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for refuge because that donkey, فَإِنَّهُ رَأَى shaytan. That donkey has seen a devil. So subhanAllah, these animals, even from their noises, there is a blessing for us. There's a, One of the times of accepted dua is the time when a rooster crows because the Prophet says that it's seen an angel, it's seen a light source that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that we are incapable of seeing. Now, something else that we find uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us through these animals is that taking care of these animals, you know, can either be our ticket to paradise or it can be our ticket to hellfire. And this is something very powerful because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us the woman that was actually a prostitute, uh, a Zaniya, and she came across a dog that was thirsty and she felt compassion for that dog and so she took her shoe and she filled it with water and she gave water to that dog. And SubhanAllah, I often ask myself, you know, if the Prophet ﷺ said that Jannah was given to that woman for the sake of that, that she was forgiven for her sins, and Jannah was given to her on the basis of that, what would most religious people do? They'd say, you know, if a dog came by, this is najas and that, you know, this is impure, they try to kick it out the way and so on and so forth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave... Yeah, that again leads to problems in my perception of what it really means to follow the hadith. We again have hadiths that contradict each other. There are certain hadiths that are against dogs, speaking against dogs. And now you have this example that this woman is actually going to paradise because she gave water to the dog. With all due respect, please let me know in the comment section what you guys think. As I said previously, it is very, very hard for me to accept hadiths as truth because as you can see, they are contradicting each other. This woman Jannah for giving water to a dog. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave another woman hellfire because she imprisoned a cat as the Prophet sallallahu said not allowing the cat to fetch its own food or drink and not giving it any food or drink. And so these are sources of rahmah for us. They're sources of mercy. They could be our ticket to paradise. And as a believer, I should look at it in an optimistic sense. And I shouldn't think to myself at any moment that there are many human beings that are dying today. Why should I even be worried about the animals? Because the Prophet ﷺ was concerned about the birds. Even on the way back from a battle, Rasulullah ﷺ heard the complaint of a bird whose egg was taken from its nest. So the Prophet ﷺ actually stops the companions and shows compassion to those birds. So there's no point in life where we should stop caring about the animals, where it becomes an either or thing. Islam teaches us that you know the earth will testify for us or against us. What about the animals? And of course what that means is we should be even more kind and considerate towards human beings and things of that sort. Now. Uh, there are certain interesting facts that the Messenger Sallallahu mentioned to us as well about taking care of certain animals and the effect that it has on our personalities. You know, scientifically taking care of certain breeds, uh, you know, brings a sense of compassion. It nurtures compassion sure. in a human being. Uh, cat owners tend to, to be more sensitive and compassionate. And that's why you find Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know, the sweet personality. Maybe that had something to do with it, the way that he was with cats. And the Prophet ﷺ told us about uh, the different types of animal breeders and the personality traits that they might develop. So he said وسلم, that there will come a time when the best property of a man will actually be his sheep. And what he's talking about وسلم, is in the time of fitan, of great tribulation, that the, the safest person is the one who can take his sheep, just take some sheep with him and go to a place where he's free from all of the, that corruption and all of that tribulation. So it's actually a form of risk. For him, particularly, it's a form of sustenance. It's actually something that I heard within the Orthodox Church as well, that there will come a time in the end of days where the Christians will just live around sheep and this will be the safest for them because they won't be able to participate within society. Within Christianity, we say it is the mark of the beast that will enslave all of humanity. Some Orthodox Church fathers believe that this mark of the beast is actually a chip, a crypto chip with which you will be forced to pay an identification chip so to speak, and without it, you won't be able to participate in this modern technocracy. And this is why they say the best way for Christians is to get out of those mega cities, simply get some animals and live with them. Particularly in a time of fitna. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, uh, that you tend man. to find pride and arrogance amongst, amongst the owners of, of horses and camels. <laughs> so he said, those Bedouins that are busy with the camels and the horses, they don't have time for their deen, they don't have time for their religion. 
Well, he said that humility and gentleness are the characteristics of Ahlul Ghanam, uh, the people that own sheep, the shepherds of sheep. And the Prophet ﷺ of course told us that all of the Prophets at one point in time were shepherds. Sure. Rasulullah ﷺ, his first Jesus career sure. was as a shepherd. Now, the last thing that we take here, and I get asked this question all the time about animals is, can I have my pet in Jannah? Can I have animals in Jannah? Or is it that we just go to Jannah and there are no more animals? Because some people develop a great sense of attachment to animals. Now, obviously they are free from, you know, uh, from accountability, you know, eternal accountability. So they don't have Jannah and Nar, paradise and hellfire in that sense. However, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, he narrates that a Bedouin came to the Messenger Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, I love horses. Will I get to have horses in Jannah? I love horses. Do I get horses in Jannah? And the Prophet Wasallam said, if you are admitted into Jannah, utita bi farasin min yaquta, you'll be given a horse of rubies. <laughs> and that horse would be brought to you with two wings and it will carry you wherever you want it to carry you. So yes, you can have animals in Jannah as well if you love them that much. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enter us into Jannah to be able to have those animals. Allahumma ameen. Alright guys, and this is it for today's video. Much less about dinosaurs and more about compassion towards the animals. As I said, ultimately I personally do not believe in dinosaurs. I think it's fake. I think Hollywood just made up something to entertain us and further delude us. When I see those bones, they are often put into certain structures that are then supposed to resemble a dinosaur with a lot of artistry. I do not buy it. But when it comes down to compassion, towards animals for me this is common sense i believe we should treat all beings with dignity and with respect and especially the animals we eat i'm absolutely against animal agriculture and industrial scale slaughterhouses but as I said throughout the video, more questions got raised. How come that we have two hadiths that are apparently sahih on both ends, but they contradict each other? How can we justify that? And moreover, why are those things not mentioned within the Quran? Why do we need certain hadiths as an addition? But then again, we do have contradicting hadiths. For me personally, this is extremely confusing. I would really appreciate if you can clarify this for me in the comment section. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. As always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.